So, Bill, um, when I asked you to write a concerto after a Vivaldi Four Seasons, I asked you which season, and you said autumn, and I asked you which instrument do you want to write for, and you said bass clarinet, which is what led us to work with Sarah Watts on this yes. fabulous piece that you've written. So can you tell me a little bit about what led you to that season and that instrument? Well, I, I suppose um, just sort of reflecting on my, my ancient status now, you know, as a sort of uh, uh, emeritus professor. Indeed. That, indeed. Um, it leads you that. No, I, a few years ago I collaborated on a uh, BBC series called The Loch mm. and it was different seasons on a Scottish loch right. with no narration, it was just the music and oh, wow. the things and I got given autumn to do. Uh -huh. um, so I, I can assure you I, I didn't include any of that music <laughs> when it was already spoken for. <laughs> All know, right. that, that. So I knew I had to borrow something else to get this piece going. Yes. But no, I just I suppose I felt more comfortable about the idea of the colours, uh, the atmosphere, uh -huh. and so on. And I wanted to use the bass clarinet because, um, apart from having played it occasionally um, over the over the years, um, it, it's usually used in a lot in you know, film music and so on as a kind of sinister back growling backdrop, yeah. you know, something that's there. But it actually has a whole life of its own. Mm -hmm. um, recognisably a clarinet sound, but deeper. And something completely else. And other. with its sort of, you know, with perhaps without the same flashy ring in the top register. But there is a top register. Mm. And there's a lot going in the sound world. So that, and I'd worked a couple of times before with Sarah. Yes and thought that this would be, uh, this should be a, a concerto that demands something of that kind of virtuosity. That calibre, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the other constrictions I attempted to place on you was yeah. the idea of something loosely modelled on Vivaldi's three movements, which you then uh, got round by suggesting it could be up to three movements, but you managed to pull it off in a rather ingenious way. Well, I hope. It's ingenious rather than <laughs> uh, uh, taking the obvious, but um, in it, no, I, I, I couldn't really tell. Uh, I could have set out, mm. let's say, and said, well, okay, three movements, how am I going to mirror the Vivaldi in some ways? Mm. And then, but then I think sometimes the best homage to something is to take off in your own direction. Uh -huh with a fragment of something of what he does. What, what he does is brilliantly in these pieces is give you little musical images which aren't directly, not in the kind of Britainish word painting, you know, like Benjamin Britten word painting uh, type of uh, music, but he'll often give you little figures and, uh, and textures which just suggest the season that mm -hmm. he's in. Mm -hmm. So I was starting from that point of, uh, let, let's, I always have to start pieces with, let's see what's going to happen. Right. The worst pieces are where I know what I'm doing right. from the start. Um, so I want to start with some material and then play with it and see where that leads. Mm -hmm. And where that led was, uh, to just the feeling that this could could be something which is recursive. We're turning over the tune or elements of the tune again and again mm -hmm. in order to make a bigger shape. And yeah. it seemed to me the bigger shape was more important than slavishly doing three movements. But <laughs> anyway, as they say, um, I tried to explain to the audience yeah. last night that there were in fact three movements. Yes. Um, after the piece starts, one section of strings plays some material which is theirs alone and they ignore everything else that's going on basically and yep. just play very quietly. And that might be a cloudscape or a landscape. And then the main body of the strings could be a figure walking through the landscape. They usually play some repetitive figures yeah, yeah which introduce the main soloist and sometimes answer back and sometimes do something 
slightly different. Mm -hmm. And then the main, so that's movement two. Yeah. And then the bass clarinet is perhaps the inside of this person who's walking through the landscape's head. Perhaps Burns, because and as the piece is based on a, uh, one of the tunes that Burns used for Westland Winds. Yes. Um, and Burns always, when he was composing poetry, often walked, and we know he'll, he almost invariably had a tune in his head. Yep, yep. Um, so that was my idea that perhaps the bass clarinet is the inside of the head as he's turning over the material this way and that, trying various things out. Um, and that's movement three. Ah, right. But, so there are three movements, but they all happen at the same In time. time. <laughs> yes. Okay, excellent. Simultaneous. Um, and I think to, to round off this conversation, I'd just like to find out a little bit about um, your impression of writing for Sarah, because it was specifically her that you mentioned, and she's premiered the piece and recorded it, uh, apart from the fact that she is obviously technically virtuoso at the, at the mm -hmm. clarinet. What were some of the other qualities you thought about when you were thinking about writing for Sarah? Well, I like to think of technicality and virtuosity, not just as a movement of the fingers, mm. which she has in abundance. Yeah. Um, was always, as a clarinet player, something I had to work really hard just to compete with some of my fellow students at. It wasn't my thing. But I learned from our uh, a teacher, my teacher, Alan Hacker, mm -hmm. uh, who Sarah also did some studies with, that virtuosity was as much about producing the right tone colour yes. in the right way mm. at the right time, mm. having thought about it, and being able to deliver that. Yes. That that's, uh, that's the kind of virtuosity that Sarah has, as well as the very obvious facility in getting round the instrument. She thinks about the material that she's playing and thinks it through. She doesn't just play it. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a little bit more then, just to round off, about how the poem by Robert Burns, Westland Winds in Autumn, yeah. uh, infuses itself throughout the concerto? What are some of the ideas or feelings or impressions you got from that? Yeah. Well, I, I, it, it's one of these wonderful poem. There are a number of them in the Scots language by Burns and by others like McDermott, which start off as nature poems, mm -hmm. then turn into personal reflections of various kinds, and, can it, and this one ends up as a love poem. Yes, it does. Um, so it's all of these things um, going through. It's not just a placid pastoral not uh, at all. thing, because there, there are there is anger in it, mm -hmm. but in this keen observation of nature, mm -hmm. but also it's wrapped up in his personal feelings and his, motion, his emotions. Yep. So what I've tried to do is work with, with that and take the various elements of the tune and work with them, you know, take a shape from the tune. And I've got pages and pages of sketches of distortions of that shape. Mm -hmm no longer the original intervals, but, yeah. um, you know, a, a simple up, down, up again movement could be much, much bigger than in the original tune, or much flatter than the original tune in yeah. pitch. So all of these things I was playing about with um, in order just to get going. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. Bill, thank you very much indeed. Well, it's been an enormous pleasure uh, being here and working with the Glasgow Barons and with Sarah, and thank you for the opportunity. My great pleasure, thanks.